total and complete body paralysis on the tattoo table like and then next minute pew, god threw me into the hell that was prepared for me when i died and suddenly i break out of the tunnel and i'm just hovering in this brilliant bright white light like i mean the brilliance of this light like if you're in your fleshly form you'd be so I just keep screaming at him and screaming at him and screaming at him to prove himself and then suddenly he does. Now what happens next and the way it happened, like this cannot happen unless it's God himself doing it. So why don't you just uh, start off by telling us a bit about yourself, who you are. Amelia, my name's Amelia Russell, I'm 33 years old used to work disability now i work work from home which is actually a blessing so i get to play with my dogs all day so that's pretty sweet um so i was born in adelaide radelaide <laughs> yeah i used to live a very very sinful life i was a, a stripper and a drug addict um obviously i wouldn't strip where i lived so i'd be flying in and out to canberra and to sydney and i was living in two places at once and my housemate in sydney i was like a, a drug dealer i had you know unlimited free drugs I was doing cocaine and pretty much anything I wanted every single day. Completely absolute drug addict. Like I was a criminal, my friends were criminals. Like it was really, really bad. A lot worse than what, you know, people would think. What was it like for you growing up? You know, did you grow up with Jesus in your life? Did you go to church or anything like that? Or how did you grow up? What was your family life like, your friends, school? Yeah, yeah I grew up. My dad was a Christian and he used to take me to church. I just kind of went. I don't really think I really knew, you know, I just kind of went and just followed what they did. Um, but then when I, you know, got older and moved out of home, I thought it was just a bunch of fairy tales and I kind of became an atheist and fully started just rejecting God. Growing up at school, didn't really have many friends, got picked on a lot. I was that kid that got bullied. It's a bit of a tomboy. Just spent most of my days just riding my bike and I'm <laughs> I'm glad I didn't grow up in this generation, otherwise they would have convinced me to like have a sex change or something. <laughs> oh, the world's going crazy. Did you have any spiritual experiences when you were young through school? Did, were you into new age or anything like that? No, 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 when I was at school, when I was at school, I was a Christian. Well, sort of like, I think just, you know, cause my family was, I was, I was all right at school. My dad did all right, got good grades. I did have a car accident though, like around the beginning of year 12. So I missed out on most of the school year because um, I broke both of my legs and I was in a wheelchair. Oh, I, I was driving a van and there's no front to a van and I was stopped at a traffic light and had a guy hit me front on. So the whole van went and crushed both of my legs at the same time. Yeah, I nearly, nearly died from that. But you know, by the grace of God, didn't. I guess in your early life, maybe teenage years, what, what was your family? Like, was there any trauma, any difficult times that you're going through at this age or was life pretty easy at the time? Oh, my, my dad and mum, you know, divorced and stuff. My mum ended up dating a, a transvestite uh, pr pretty much my whole childhood. Her name was Jody. it was a six foot tall man in a dress. So I kind of grew up around all that, but yeah, and then I think I just, got further and further and further away from God the older I got. But yeah, a little bit of a weird, weird childhood, I would say. But then again, I guess it's not weird now. Like back then it was weird. Now everyone's like parading it. My partner when I was at school was like 26 and I was like 17. So I was probably not, not too good. You know, just had partners growing up. When I got into stripping, it got really, really bad. I was just kind of like using guys as toys. What age? Were you when you started stripping? How'd you get into it? I used to manage the Crazy Horse and the Firm in Adelaide, two of the biggest strip clubs in Adelaide. So yeah, when you're managing those clubs and you're working, you know, six days a week, 13 hour shifts and taking home an income that's less than what these girls take home in one day, it was kind of like, yeah, this is ridiculous. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go give this a try. So then I did, I left Adelaide, flew to Canberra where I, figured no one would know me and and started stripping so I could make um, big money. Is, is there like a um, like a particular night that you can remember where something happened or like what, or walk us through a typical night, a big night for you? Oh, well, see the clubs I was working in, King's Cross, they were they were just rotten clubs. Like the, the, the owners of the clubs 
knew like that where you were selling drugs like I would sell drugs in the club it would be like I'd say to someone you know I'll you take me for one hour down like dance upstairs and I'll sell you this bag of cocaine and then we'd take them upstairs just rat cocaine bag after bag after bag just keeping them up there until the sun came up because these these clubs they either turn the cameras off or had areas in the rooms that were just not covered intentionally so we could get them up there and just absolutely rot them with drugs, get them off their heads so you just clear out their bank accounts kind of thing. It was, it was wrong. It was really, really wrong. When you, when you work in that environment and you see the most putrid men, like it just puts a bad name on men. And it got to the point where I just despised men. Like I'd just be like, oh, I'll just look at someone and just be like, what a putrid, like disgusting man. Like I'm gonna rip him for everything he's got. Because you, you see the worst of people. You don't see the best of people in those places. And it just kind of makes you loathe and detest those people. So you kind of take pleasure in, in rotting them, which is bad. You, your mindset in there, like a lot of the girls in the in strip clubs are lesbians because they see the worst of men. Uh, a lot of them have the same mentality. I can't, I can't speak for all of them but a lot of them do have that mentality where all you get is these just putrid men that just want to abuse you. So then you just want to abuse them. And it's just this cycle of just, it's, it's just not a, not a healthy environment, not a good environment at all. So I, I imagine you're getting paid quite a lot of money every week. What would you do with that money? Was that something that kept blow you it. going? <laughs> you could blow it. I could make, you know, I could make three, four grand in one night and then blow it and just on stupid stuff just absolutely you just find that you just end up just blowing your money on just stupid stuff all the time like i collected takoya watches i'll spend you know five six grand on a watch you know a thousand dollars on a handbag or a jacket or, or clothing or shoes or just just stuff that you just i gave it all away <laughs> i ended up giving it all away you just uh cars just just yeah nothing permanent you just end up blowing it Blew a lot of it on holidays. And what, what was your like close circle at the time? Did you have other friends who didn't know what you were doing? What about your family? Did they know? No, my family didn't know. I didn't tell my friends in Adelaide. I kept my personal life and my um, work life very separate. That's why I flew away from Adelaide to work to make sure that no one I grew up with ever, you know, bumped into me. So how, how were you at the moment? Like what was your mental state at the time? You know, were you doing anything spiritual at the time either? Or did you connect with anything? No, I just blocked it out. I thought I believed in evolution and aliens. I didn't believe there was a God. I used to believe we got reincarnated, come back as another person. I never looked at any YouTube back then. I just worked, partied, slept, maybe watched a movie here and there. I didn't, did not look into anything. I just believed everything they said. Um, after sort of four or five years or so that you were doing it, did it start to take a toll on you mentally and physically at all or were you? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Mentally it was just absolutely exhausting. I found that I had to, I had to be on drugs and alcohol just to get through the day. Is this where the tattoos started coming in as well? Or? Oh no, I've just been getting these since I was about 18. No, it's kind of just like one big one. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. That is I don't know. They, they all connect. It's just the whole body. So tell us about how, you led up to the point where you accepted Jesus in your life. It happened in 2018. I didn't, I didn't believe in God. I was, I said I was an atheist. I believe in aliens and evolution, all that kind of stuff. I was in my hometown of Adelaide and I was um, getting a tattoo, a big atheist tattoo on my bum cheek, you know, kind of thinking I knew it all, thinking I knew the meaning of the universe, like being really cocky. I was in Front Yard Tattoo in Mount Barker in Adelaide. A tattoo artist was tattooing my entire ass cheek with this mockery to God tattoo. It's just like a big, it's like an astronaut floating around in space, you know, cause I believe in evolution all that. I was gonna get my other butt cheek done as well as like they were gonna be like a, you know, in it. anyway. As I'm lying on the tattoo table, getting my ass cheek tattooed, this tattoo is a mockery to God, like practically like, ha ha ha, God doesn't exist. Suddenly my whole body gets like, like paralyzed. Total and complete body paralysis on the tattoo table. Like can't move, can't talk, can't even blink. And then next minute it's like, God threw me into the hell that was prepared for me when I died. Like God showed me where I would go unless I changed my ways 
and gave my life to him. And like there was there was no concept of time in the place that I was. It's, it's hard to explain because we're living in time, but I'm telling you right now, there was no time in the place that I was. Time did not exist. I was awake when this happened. It's like, it's not like, oh, you know, people are like, oh, you're imagining it or like, no, no, no. It's like, imagine you're just standing there and next minute you get like transported to Mars. Like I just, I got taken to another dimension. Like I was physically there. And I can't tell you what you know what your hell, your hell would be like. Everyone's hell's different. This hell was perfectly choreographed around my life to torment me until the great white throne of judgment. And then eventually like my body got released from hell and I sat up from the tattoo table and I'm freaking out. Like I'm absolutely freaking out. I'm trying to comprehend what just happened. But your mind, your physical mind cannot comprehend the horrors that you see down there. Like in the spiritual, it's like trying to fit a, a swimming pool of water in, into like a thimble. Like you just cannot comprehend it. It just can't fit in there. That much information just like can't fit in your fleshly form. So anyway, I sit up from the tattoo table and, and everyone in the tattoo parlor, they, everyone stopped what they're doing. They're, they've surrounded my tattoo table and they've called me an ambulance to rush me to hospital. They think that I'm having a seizure or something, but I just, I just say to everyone, just, just take me out the back. I want to separate myself from all these onlookers that are like, you know, watching me and looking at me. So they take me out the back of the tattoo parlor, the owner of the tattoo shop. He brings out this office chair for me to sit in. So I sit in this office chair and I got my head in my hands and I'm, I'm freaking out. Like I'm, I'm trying to comprehend what just happened, but you, you can't comprehend it. And then suddenly as I'm sitting there, my whole body gets and gets paralyzed a second time. Like can't move, can't talk, can't even blink. And then this little voice in my head was like, kind of like mocking me in a way, like atheist, huh? You think you know it all? I'm gonna show you. Then next minute my whole body like from the chest gets like whooshed forward and I go speeding through a tunnel. Like I'm speeding so fast that starlight is becoming literal lines shooting past my face. And I'm heading towards this light at the end of the tunnel. And suddenly I break out of the tunnel and I'm just hovering in this brilliant bright white light. Like, I mean, the brilliance of this light was so bright. Like if you're in your fleshly form, you'd be dust. That's how bright this light was. But for some reason I could look upon this light and not be blinded. Now there was no floor, no wall, no ceiling. I'm just hovering in light. And then overwhelming comes over me with this feeling of just peace and love and like everything's going to be okay like i just came out of hell and now it's suddenly i got this hand on me saying it's okay i've got you and then faster than i saw nothing but light all i saw was light my whole body gets sucked backwards through this tunnel now i'm speeding as fast backwards as what i was speeding forwards and then suddenly like my body gets plonked back in the tattoo parlor and I'm back in the tattoo parlor with the memory of my hell. Now, over the next few weeks, I'm trying to tell all my friends, like, guys, guys, like, please believe me. Like, God showed me hell. Like, God showed me hell. Please believe me. All my friends are calling me crazy. They're all like, you're brainwashed. Go seek mental help. But I know what I heard. I know what I saw. I know where I was. That is something that can never be taken away from me. So after I realized God's real, we're living in the end days, is coming, like I realized, you know, all my friends rejected me. I don't, there's no reason for me to be in Adelaide anymore. So I decided to move up to Queensland. I have family up here and I wanted to be closer to them. So I, I jump in my car and I do a road trip down to Adelaide. And as I'm driving my car, I'm talking to God on this like really long road trip. And I'm talking to God, I'm like, God, all my friends are calling me crazy. All my friends are calling me brainwashed. And I'm like, God, if you don't prove yourself to me right now, I'm gonna believe I'm insane. I'm gonna believe I'm crazy. I'm gonna believe what everyone's saying about me. And I start screaming at the top of my lungs. Like, I mean, screaming, like, prove yourself God, or I'm gonna think I'm crazy. And I'm screaming and I'm screaming and I'm screaming. Like I'm relentlessly just screaming to God, prove yourself God or I'm insane. Like I'm, I'm screaming so much and so loud, I'm almost losing my voice. That's how much I'm screaming to him. So I just keep screaming at him and screaming at him and screaming at him to prove himself. And then suddenly he does. Now what happens next and the way it happened 
Like this cannot happen unless it's God himself doing it. The radio in my car just changed itself and it blast. I mean it blast. Like imagine getting your radio and going up to like the loudest it goes and then timesing it by like 10, you know, like the loudest you've ever heard. So God just like God absolutely blast messages through song. Now these messages like fit my life. They tell me I'm saved. They tell me I'm on the right path. And meanwhile, these messages are playing. I'll ask God a rhetorical question in my mind. Like, you know, rhetorical, like deep down, you know the answer to that question. Like, are drugs bad? Like, don't be dumb, don't be dumb. Like you answer that question. God wants you to answer that question. So the moment the question was asked, God would pause the radio, complete blasting music to absolute radio silence. And God would wait very patiently, I might add, for me to answer the question out loud with the answer that he wanted to hear. Now, it didn't matter how long or how short it took me to answer that question, whether it took five seconds or five minutes, it didn't matter. The split second that answer had finished exiting out of my lips, bow, God would blast the radio with another message through song and then another question and pause blasting music to total radio silence. Once again, waiting very patiently for me to answer the question out loud with the answer that he wanted to hear. And it didn't matter how long or how short it took me to answer, literally the split second that answer had finished exiting out of my lips. Bow, God would blast the radio with another message through song. And then another question and pause. God did this again and again and again and again and again i'm like bowling my eyes out i'm driving my car like trying to keep straight on the road just like oh my god oh my god oh my god you ruined i'm crying and i'm crying like i'm literally like bowling my eyes out like i'm like my eyes are so filled with water i'm like trying to see in front of me and i'm crying and i'm like thank you god thank you god you're real like i just I, i'm just in so much shock i like i can't believe what just happened but it happened and I'm just like thanking God. I'm like, thank you, God, you're real, you're real. And then it's like suddenly the radio in my car, it just changed itself again. I've never heard the bass in my car so loud. God comes through the radio and he tells me that it's God himself doing it. Now he hasn't just done this once, he's, he's done this several times, like several times. Like he did it late night in the gym one time. He did it in the shopping center before. Uh, he's done it in the hospital once, uh, several times in my car, even to the point where he'll put on a snippet of a piece of song and then change the radio and then put on a snippet of another piece of a different song and then change the radio and then put on a snippet of another piece of a different song and then using snippets from different bits of songs that have been mashed together, he makes a message like Bumblebee from Transformers, like completely supernatural. So when like anyone ever says to me like, oh, how do you know God's real? It's like, I know God's real. Like it's not even a question for me. Like I 100% know God's real. I was even sitting in my lounge room one day, just, just chilling out, just watching TV. When suddenly out of nowhere, it's like, my whole peripheral vision just goes and then it just zooms in and it's Jesus on the cross and the entire world is his footstool. So I know God's real. I know Jesus is God and, and you know, he's been coming to me again and again and it's, it's, it's always, you know, he wants us to know he's coming. He's coming now and we need to get ready or we're going to get left behind. And yeah, believe me, guys, you don't want to get left behind during this tribulation. It's, it's going to be hell on earth. Let's talk about... Um where your life has gone since then so since coming to know jesus as god how has that changed your life and what have you started doing to live your life for him i just try and live my life like the bible try and stick to his 10 commandments i um obviously left dancing all my dancer friends like they all most of them thought i was crazy a couple of them believe me one of them left dancing as well she's had her own little walk with god now i got out of that sinful life and I just try and live my life every day now in glorifying God and just try and let as many people know as possible. I evangelize, so I you know, walk around the streets with signs and pass out flyers and I go to the Gold Coast in Kavalav on Friday nights and walk around with big signs telling people that Jesus is coming and passing out flyers and Saturday nights I go to Fortitude Valley. <laughs> right out the front of my old strip club <laughs> and let them all know that Jesus is coming and just try and tell as many people as I possibly can but until we go up 
till we get ruptured. I'll keep doing it until the day that Jesus takes me home. So how do people normally react or, or what kind of conversations do you have with people out on the street? Sometimes they're good, sometimes not so good. I find that the ones that need to be saved God will bring them. You know, it's like, I find that it's like a division going on because, you know, God's separating the sheep from the goats. It's either getting harder to wake people up or easier to wake people up. I find that there's a lot of, um, a lot of anger out there. Like I'll just have people come up to me for no reason and just bash me up or hit me or kick me or like spit in my face or pour drinks over my head or like, you know, just for no reason. Is that something that happens regularly? Yeah, it does. It's better when I'm in a group if I'm alone, it happens more if I'm alone. But I think when you're in a group, people are a bit more hesitant. But you know, sometimes I'll have really good witnesses once you kind of explain to them what's happening in the world and connect it to what the Bible says will happen in the end days. Like a lot of the times it's like a light switch goes on in their head and you know, it just all makes sense to them. Do you know what? I find the easiest way that I can convince people that God's real is I let them know, hey, like the rulers of this world like you think they're bad, like you have no idea how bad they are. And I just let them know that, you know, this world's run by satanic elite. They're all occults, like they're all, you know, all their celebrities that people worship and adore, they're all, they're all Illuminati, they all do it. And a lot of people are kind of awake and know a little bit about it. And as soon as you can connect that to say, hey, like all the world's, you know, kings and queens and celebrities and politicians and like, you know, all the people with power and influence, if they all worship Satan, isn't it pretty obvious that if the rulers of the world worship Satan, that there's, there's a God? Because the Bible said that the rulers of the world worship Satan. The Bible says Satan's the ruler of this world, you know, and, and he gives people fame, money, fortune, power, and in return, they fulfill his will. They groom everyone through television and media and all their influences to groom everyone into thinking sin looks cool, to groom everyone into thinking, oh, Satan's a really good guy. You know, like Miley Cyrus, oh, Satan's been a better father to me than my own father. Or Billie Eilish, like in all her videos, like her black goo, fallen goo, angel wings, my Lucifer is lonely, or Christian Bale accepted his accepted his Academy Award saying I'd like to thank Satan for this and people think they're joking they're not joking they actually are thanking Satan their God so tell us how spiritually Jesus has changed your life and how you what, what's your relationship with Jesus like today oh he's my king he's my Lord he's my Savior and like ah, oh, I can't wait to leave this world I know that sounds bad because like everyone's gonna die during the tribulation, but I just, I just can't wait for it to happen so I can be gone. I just want to see him. I just want to, I just want to be with him and, and follow him around like a little puppy dog wherever he goes. I am, I'm ready to go. That's for sure. He's my Lord. He's my King. He's my Savior. He's my everything. And there's nothing I want in this world. There's, there's nothing that ties me or holds me to this world. When I have Jesus, I have everything. Like there's nothing else I need. I have everything already because I, I have him and I, I thank him every day. I'm like, thank you, Lord Jesus. I still have no idea why he did what he did, but I'm, I'm so grateful, <laughs> I'm so grateful. Otherwise, honestly, if I, honest, if I was living the life that I used to live, I would probably be dead. Like my old housemate, you know, did 13 years hard time for robbing banks. Like I surrounded myself with criminals and I myself was a criminal. And I honestly believe that I would have been dead if God did not intervene. What advice do you have to people who know that God has reached out to them, but they haven't bothered to pay attention? Pay attention, like seriously, pay attention. Time is short. And if you keep sitting on the fence, you're going to be left behind. You're going to be like, you know, that parable of the 10 virgins, five are wise, five are foolish. The five foolish virgins get left behind. You don't want to be left behind. It will be the biggest mistake you ever make in your life. Like there's no, don't gamble your eternal soul. Like what would, what would you trade for an eternal soul? And would you sell your eternal soul for money, drugs, sex? There's nothing worth an eternal soul. What is it to, you know, gain this whole world, but to lose that? This life's but what, a drop in the ocean compared to all of eternity. So you want to make sure that you end up in the right eternity. So stop ignoring God, because in the end, it's not going to you know, violate your free will and force salvation upon you. You must come to him. And finally, just for anyone who might be living the life that you did before, maybe to any strippers out there or anyone addicted to drugs, taking advantage of people, living any, any kind of life like that. What advice do you have for them? Now you may not think that you have 
the strength to fight it on your own, but you know, we're not, we're not doing it on our strength. We're doing it on the strength of God. So just lean in him and just give it all to him. Just be like, Jesus, I, I'm not strong enough to cope with this. I need you to take this from me and he will get you through. You know, the Bible says God will never give you more than you can handle. And if you turn to him, he will give you that strength to get through. You know, you just have to trust in him. You just got to stop relying on yourself and start trusting in God. All right. Well, thank you very much. All that's left really now is just to pray for anyone who might be watching this video. You know what, the people that I really want to pray for in my life is my family. I've been telling them this since 2018 and they don't listen to me, they don't they don't believe me. I find families the hardest people. Family and friends, people that you've known your whole life, they're the hardest ones to wake up. And I just I just pray God wakes them up, Lord Jesus. I just I just really pray for my family that you can reveal yourself to them as you revealed yourself to me. And I just really pray, Lord, that you come to them and, and lead them to you, Lord. Make them see the truth, Lord, because they're veiled right now. They, they can't see the truth. Just make it clear. Make it just so obvious, Lord, that, that you know, you're real. Because I don't want my family to get left behind. It's going to be horrible if they get left behind, Lord. I, just, I pray for any friends as well, Lord. Any friends, Lord, that don't know you, I pray, Lord, that you lead them to you. Out of everything that you can pray for, you know, there's, there's nothing more important than praying for literally their salvation. So that's what I pray for, Lord salvation of everyone that I love and hold dear and you know who they are God. Amen. That's it. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> there we go. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.